but uh, but I, I very much appreciate the introduction, and um, I am uh, really thrilled to be able to share with everyone um, a little bit about um, the recent monograph um, that I wrote and some of the research that went into it, and uh, hopefully also to be able to talk a little bit about some of uh, how the this particular book fits into a kind of broader research agenda that um, I'm continuing to look at and that I'm, you know, I know a community of other scholars that are also working on related issues, um, especially here in the in the region, um, in Hong Kong and in mainland China and in some parts of greater China, there are um, uh, a growing number of scholars that are really beginning to respond to uh, the way that today's China is increasingly engaged with the international legal order and with international institutions by looking back over the history and really starting to delve into a lot of these aspects of uh, international legal history that Chinese figures and uh, the governments of various points in Chinese history were actually closely engaged with. So uh, I think that in a you know very meaningful sense as we look towards China's future, uh, which is increasingly international, we're also kind of collectively as, uh, you know, people in very many different disciplines that study China uh, are increasingly looking towards aspects of the past. Um, and that includes China's relationship with international law and international legal institutions that have been um, rather um, buried to, to a large extent in the pre-existing scholarship. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that is still left to explore. Um, so in just in terms of introducing my um, examination of uh, China's role in the transformation of the international legal order, um, I really sort of focused on this kind of really key transitional period between the mid 19th through the uh, mid 20th centuries. And um, this was the point at which many aspects of the international legal order that we have with us today were formed. Um, if you look at the early part of this period in the 19th century, this is when many of these sort of basic concepts of intervention uh, and modern doctrines of sovereignty were first being uh, established. And, and as a contrast with earlier eras or epochs, um, as Wilhelm Greve would say, in the history of international law, uh, had a very different doctrines surrounding the nature of the state and relationships among states. And many of our present ideas about what is a sovereign state and how does it fit into the inter international community really date to this uh, kind of key period uh, of beginning in the mid 19th century, which also happens to be the same period when China itself was first being introduced into the system. Um, and uh, of course, uh, many of our current major international institutions date to the post-World War II moment when uh, the United Nations order was being established. And uh, again, China was a significant player uh, at that stage as well. So uh, in focusing on those periods uh, in this book, I really was interested in looking at um, both this kind of origin point for many of the key ideas of international order that we have with us today and the origin point for many of the actual specific rules and organizations slash institutions that we still have with us today, uh, which come in towards sort of the end of the uh, of the narrative. Um, and what I found was that uh, you know, in looking for the evidence of China's presence uh, in this history, uh, there was quite a lot of contribution that was occurring from Chinese actors, and there was an even greater amount of contribution that was occurring by Western actors acting upon China uh, as an object of regulation. Uh, and so uh, to a large extent, I wanted to look at both of those factors and try to see how they helped to shape the development of international legal order beginning in this uh, 19th uh, century, mid 19th century period, and really continuing through um, as much of the 20th century as I could essentially try and fit into the book uh, before running into uh, trouble with the editors for, uh, for surpassing the word limit. Um, so essentially what uh, what I was trying to do in that sense was not to revolutionize our understanding of China's role in international legal history, uh, 
Um, I think there's a lot of actually quite excellent work that is out there that has looked at many aspects of this story. Um, and so uh, one of the main kind of um, traditional authors uh, on this subject, Emmanuel Xu, he was writing on China more or less from the international relations uh, history perspective, um, starting in the in the you know 1960s, um, and was writing you know really quite excellent works, uh, working with diplomatic sources. Not all of the sources that are currently available were available uh, at that point, um, and so there's some lacuna in the uh, in the research just based on availability of sources that has changed over time. Um, but nonetheless, many of the existing studies of how China uh, and Chinese officials and uh, diplomats interacted with uh, the West and representatives of the West in terms of these sort of key moments of treaty making, um, the Nanjing Treaty of 1842, the post-Second uh, Opium War treaties, um, many of these studies are really quite um, quite robust, and as I went back and you know looked through many of the archival sources on the Chinese side as well as on the Western sides, I found that there were you know many aspects that had been handled quite excellently in existing secondary scholarship. So I was not out to sort of overturn the existing narratives um, in that sense. Um, but what I was interested in doing was to try and uh, put different aspects of the existing scholarship in conversation with each other. And so there are many aspects, for example, of China's role in international legal history that have been looked at in terms of interactions with, uh, you know, between the Qing dynasty and uh, the representatives of Britain, uh, but where those studies have not necessarily been put in direct conversation with uh, equally good studies of the Chinese uh, relationship with the Japanese uh, envoys uh, making specific demands or with um, Chinese officials and lawyers' own internal conversations about their plans and hopes for international uh, legal order uh, and for specific events, um, such as the Hague conferences, for example. So I was trying to adopt a slightly more comprehensive look by putting these different strands of the story uh, together and being able to uh, sort of move in a hopefully fluid fashion from looking at the uh, Chinese interactions with specific Western interlocutors to those with um, Japan and other regional neighbors uh, and to those happening in terms of internal discourse, uh, both officially and uh, to a certain extent within broader Chinese society in popular media and newspapers uh, and um, activism by uh, by civic organizations and by revolutionary groups as well, such as the Chinese Communist Party, um, which comes into the narrative at a few points. Um, so in terms of uh, these, uh, the relationship with some of these existing studies, um, the monograph uh, tries to trace some of these discussions over a longer time frame to juxtapose some of these sources together uh, in ways that they have not necessarily been previously, and also to adopt a broader sort of contextual view of how China's relationship with international legal norms and institutions fits into uh, broader aspects of its uh, position in geopolitics and its position in relation to international society more generally as well. Um, so the key areas in which I have found um, relatively new-ish, uh, or at least rel uh, somewhat novel conclusions, um, uh, or at least have been able to push a little bit uh, forward in, in terms of um, uh, our understanding of some of the existing conclusions in the literature, uh, include uh, really coming to appreciate the extent to which China functioned as an object for international legal regulation coming from the outside. Um, I think this is something that we all, uh, you know, sort of a, are aware of very much so. And the first kind of piece of data that tends to come up in discussions of China's role in international law history is unequal treaties, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction, and these kinds of imposed uh, structures that were coming from primarily the West, um, the later adopted by Japan as well. Um, but uh, to, to what I found uh, and what I claim in the monograph is that this is really only part of the story. This is certainly a very important aspect of China's legal regulation from the outside. But an equally important part was uh, the way that these multilateral treaty arrangements 
very uh, effectively and successively um, building one on top of the other, uh, essentially stripped the state of very essential aspects of sovereignty, um, going to fundamental aspects of national policy making, economic policy making, the ability to set tariffs, for example, um, the ability to collect tariffs, the ability to manage the uh, the basic uh, territorial, administra territorial administration of the state, the management of China's internal waters, um, and uh, you know many aspects of uh, uh, di diplomacy as well and military policy. Um, and so this loss of autonomy, uh, I think of as, as as a state, I think of as being a very important aspect of the broader story. And one that really extends beyond just the, you know, um, issue that I think has gotten the most attention so far in the scholarship, which has been that of the extraterritorial legal jurisdiction provided to foreign diplomats uh, and consuls operating within China. Well, that is extremely important. Um, I, I think it is one part of this broader loss of qualities that we currently associate with sovereign statehood. Um, and uh, much of that transformation was accomplished uh, through these very innovative uh, multilateral arrangements that are, are you know, essentially uh, kinds of groundbreaking efforts at global constitutionalism, uh, where you know there are, there's a community of nations that is trying to legislate uh, very constitution-like norms for a specific piece of territory, it just happens to be a piece of territory that is not their own, but that rather belongs to a, a kind of objectified. Um, targeted people. Um, so uh, China's role as an object of, of uh, essentially liberal legal projects, and I call them liberal because they are associated uh, in large part with the ideas of promoting free trade, free economic access uh, to Western actors, to the interior territory of China. Um, this, this was one of the key uh, points that is um, established uh, in the course of the, the narrative of the book. Uh, another key point is uh, a kind of a, additional detail regarding the process by which Western notions of state sovereignty were transmitted into China. So when I went back and looked at many of the primary sources on the Chinese side, uh, I found a slightly different or slightly new, more nuanced um, process by which these Western terms regarding the sovereignty of the state um, and the concepts associated with them were transmitted. Uh, and what I found was that um, on the one hand, uh, there were some aspects of state sovereignty that I think you really have to accept were already present in China well before contact with the West. So ideas regarding the ultimately you know, uh, plenary power of the emperor to regulate any aspect of the state that he wished to. Certainly, there was not an idea of any inherent limitation on state power. Um, and so in that sense, there were there was a conception of sovereignty um, as inhering in the figure of the monarch. That was a very robust idea of, uh, of state power that just was also melded with a particular individual. Um, but the idea of sovereignty as an alienable status, as something that could be given up as a kind of bundle of rights that could be split up and assigned legally to uh, in the course of legal uh, arrangements, this was something that was very new, certainly, and uh, it was something that only was really conveyed quite gradually uh, in terms of the Chinese reception. Uh, and really, uh, this was a process that occurred much earlier at the very elite official level. So if you look uh, in the context of the Qing dynasty diplomatic corps, they pretty early on, and perhaps even earlier on than most previous studies have um, recognized, they adopt a quite sophisticated working understanding of Western ideas of sovereignty uh, and treaty law. And it is uh, really only in a decade to do two decades after that occurs at this kind of elite intragovernmental level that you see in a broader society, including among activist intellectuals, these conversations about reclaiming China's sovereignty and the need to, uh, to assert sovereignty as a state that is equal with the West. So this process of intellectual reception of Western ideas of statehood is something that definitely occurs in um, kind of staggered stages uh, on the one hand at the government level 
and then later on at the level of elite activists and intellectuals, and then still later on at a broader public level among uh, members of the Chinese, uh, especially urban society more generally, who begin to develop strong ideas about the need to push for state sovereignty um, in the name of, uh, of the Chinese nation and of a kind of ethnic national identity uh, on par with the, the nations of the West. Um, so in the course of that same narrative, another conclusion that I reach is that some, in some international law settings, Chinese officials were actually quite active. Um, and at the very least, they were often quite active in terms of what they wanted to achieve and their efforts to promote specific alternative visions of the international legal system. And uh, in, in many cases, these were failed attempts. Um, so in essentially all of the international law uh, treaty negotiations, uh, conference and major conferences that I looked at, uh, Chinese initiatives were largely unsuccessful, um, but um, they were nonetheless sometimes quite robust. And in some quite interesting cases, they actually um, emerged early on and then would kind of continue to remain a factor in terms of internal discourse about international law in China, and then to reemerge later on uh, when the situation was slightly more favorable for uh, the Chinese diplomats to push on those, uh, on those topics in the context of these sorts of meetings. So um, the last point uh, that I really tried to develop is that regarding concrete impacts coming from China towards the international legal order as we know it. And uh, I found, you know, of course, uh, as we, you know, as, as has already been relatively well established, uh, and as I also established in the course of my earlier discussions in, in the book, many of the Chinese initiatives were not successful, and there was a huge um, set of obstacles for the Chinese side to try and surmount in order to promote their own agendas at these meetings, such as the Hague conferences, for example, um, or the post-war uh, uh, conferences to determine international legal institutions. Uh, nonetheless, some agendas over time did uh, have a relatively significant impact and at the very least resulted in Chinese actors and the Chinese state becoming spokesmen for a set of positions um, that extended beyond purely Chinese interests that were shared by many um, others uh, in the international community. And so these included, uh, in particular, the codification of international law and the idea of a kind of project of further developing and refining international law in uh, greater detail within the auspices of a kind of universal international organization with a legislative character. So this was something that uh, particular Chinese lawyers and um, judges uh, and diplomats had promoted at various stages. And we see by the, um, you know, kind of crucial post-World War II period at Dumberton Oaks and at the San Francisco Conference uh, founding the United Nations, we see the Chinese side actually being uh, the most vocal uh, in favor of this aim of codification of international law being a continuing activity under the United Nations and being something that uh, is also closely associated with another very strong, long-standing by that point Chinese interest, which is the legal regulation of uh, coercion, of aggression, uh, particularly use of force. Um, and so these are these are you know impacts. I would say at the very least on the intellectual conceptual level, there was a significant impact from China as a very important state, which was not ranked as a great power until it was introduced uh, into the UN Security Council, uh, but nonetheless was very important in terms of its global economic role, its role uh, in uh, international trade flows, and as an object of regulation uh, and as an object of competition between, between the great powers. Um, the fact that there was this consistent set of agendas that did emerge uh, after the fall of the uh, empire um, that promoted international law in a certain register, specifically that of codification and uh, restriction of uh, uses of force, uh, was something that uh, I think did play a quite significant role uh, and that we are living with some as uh, aspects of that legacy today. So um, 
In uh, what follows, I'd like to go back and kind of tell a little bit more uh, in detail some of the story and to just go sort of quickly through some of the background that I think is helpful for situating and contextualizing some of these developments and the way that these agendas emerged over time uh, and uh, how they contrasted with China's uh, role in international law uh, in the earlier period uh, of the actual empire during its heyday or during the latter part of its heyday, when there was also uh, interaction between China and the West in terms of uh, interactions, where at the very least the Western side was attempting to promote a certain vision of international law and where the Chinese side was um, interacting in a quite different way from that which would emerge later on. Um, so if we look at that process of change, um, I think it makes sense to just, you know, briefly go all the way back and to look at the very earliest uh, real interactions between China and the West. Um, so to just sum those up very briefly, um, if you look in the mid 1500s, there was Portuguese uh, direct uh, interaction with the Ming dynasty. Um, having to do with uh, procuring trade access to the Chinese interior. And this was permitted by the Ming dynasty side on a very highly restricted basis, essentially allowing the Portuguese to rent uh, Macau as a kind of port of trade that was given through the generosity of the Chinese empire. And so for the Western side, this was an international legal agreement from the Chinese perspective this was more an act of imperial benevolence and largesse, um, not something that was legally restrictive in any specific um, binding way uh, in, in the terms of Western international law. Nonetheless, this was, uh, I think you have to con consider this to be the kind of origin point for international legal in interactions by the Chinese state. Um, in the 1600s, there was, of course, the great, quite famous Chinese isolation policy, where a previous uh, policy of, of going out and naval expansion um, and exploration of new trade routes, uh, as well as coercion of foreign peoples um, in various ways, which was um, often geared towards getting them to submit tr symbolic tribute to the Chinese empire rather than the acquisition of territory. Um, was uh, that those policies which had been quite active during the latter part of the Ming dynasty uh, and the mid early and mid part of the Ming dynasty were by the very end of the dynasty were um, cut off entirely. And uh, this also coincided with and was mutually influenced by the rise of the Dutch presence in uh, East Asian waters as this major rival to the Portuguese and as specifically engaging in what the Chinese viewed as being acts essentially of outright piracy, um, targeting both China and uh, its established trade partners. Um, and so in terms of um, this kind of policy of isolation, this was something that arose sort of uh, over the course of this period, um, throughout much of the 1600s, there was this kind of withdrawal of China from the international society um, as it had been established. And this coincided with the fall of the Ming and the rise of the Qing dynasties, a very violent process of very thorough state reformation um, uh, in a very fundamental way. And only when the, once the Qing dynasty had stabilized, um, you have uh, the emperor Kangxi, emerging uh, as a very secured ruler who then says, now we may reopen our uh, borders to trade. Our seas uh, can be open to trade and we can actually uh, allow the Westerners uh, and other outsiders to come and visit our ports. Um, there was a related venture with regards to Sino-Russian relations in 1689, which uh, was intended to pacify these uh, occasional skirmishes that had arisen uh, on Ch the Qing northern territories, which were largely undefined and did not have a fixed border. So uh, via Jesuit intermediaries, the uh, Treaty of Nershinsk uh, establishes this quite uh, um, Western style set of very fixed uh, land boundaries with specific rights of mutual trade and commerce, 
rights of diplomatic uh, legations uh, being established in Beijing uh, for the Russian Empire. Um, and uh, this uh, essential stabilization of mutual bilateral relations that would last uh, about 170 years uh, from that point on. Um, of course, the relations with the West um, were rather more volatile. And so uh, in response to Western pushing for increased trade access uh, by the East India Company, um, in particular, there were uh, there was established uh, a set of shifting policies by successive Qing emperors. But um, the Canton system, which established uh, Canton, Guangzhou, as the kind of one port for foreign trade, was uh, eventually settled upon as the most uh, amenable kind of uh, intermediate position between a total shutdown of trade with uh, with the British in particular um, versus a full on opening to foreign trade, which was viewed as uh, very disruptive to different aspects of Qing governance, but including uh, the Qing side's own commercial interests um, because of the effects on various aspects of the Qing economy, such as the, the, the value of silver, coinage, and the price of key export commodities, and all of those sorts of things. Um, uh, these were uh, these policies were changed um, in successive times, uh, and uh, many of us might be familiar with the kind of famous episode in which there was an attempt from the British to send an embassy, um, an official embassy from King George III to um, Emperor Qianlong uh, at the very end of the 1700s, and this was responded to with this uh, quite. Um, is, uh, in, in its English translation, quite condescending sounding letter from the Chinese side saying, we have everything that we need. We have no desire for your foreign goods, um, your telescopes and your you know, toys uh, that you try to impress us with. Uh, and we are really quite happy uh, by ourselves in our you know, vast empire. We have all that we need here and we just permit trade with foreigners in order to benefit them. But um, you have no right to come and, you know, uh, attempt to coerce us into opening up our ports. Um, and so that was, that es essentially established this uh, tone for this key relationship really um, over the next century plus, which was that between China and Britain. And um, of course, this uh, leads up through the 1830s uh, in more or less this situation of tension in which uh, internal interests on the British side, both uh, back home and located uh, in Canton, are really pressing for increased access, um, both for the illicit sale of opium and for the sale of um, legitimate goods that have that are increasing in in price and um, profit making capabilities because of the great demand um, in within Europe. Um, and it's really the end of the East India Company's monopoly on this trade that prompts a new set of economic actors on the British side to be much more effective in pushing for a change in policy, um, which leads up to the first Opium War, um, which, um, you know, uh, recounting the, the intricacies of which is sort of beyond the scope of um, Certainly uh, the, the monograph, uh, which really starts after all of this had occurred, but I think this is useful context, um, but also of uh, looking at strictly the, year, the international legal history itself, um, which really, again, even by this point, as Chinese actors are really engaging in quite detailed negotiations with the West uh, before, during, and immediately after the first Opium War, even at this point, there is no significant reception on the Chinese side of international law concepts or vocabulary. Uh, the idea continues to be, on the one hand, uh, when China is operating from, from a position of strength, to insist on the dignity of the Chinese state and to give allowances for foreigners um, that are based on the kind of prestige of the emperor and of the dynasty, uh, and that would be compatible with that prestige. Um, and on the Western side, of course, there's the idea of trying to establish firm legal regulations and to uh, impose upon the Chinese state uh, strict obligations to provide certain forms of commercial access, 
uh, increasingly to provide uh, military access as well to Chinese territory, both on land and uh, in Chinese waters, and also to provide these additional forms of um, jurisdiction, uh, so in particular legal jurisdiction, the, the extraterritoriality system. Um, as well as jurisdiction over policymaking. So, uh, and that is where these kinds of demands, uh, post opium war demands regarding uh, issues of state autonomy and policymaking come into play. So, the Treaty of Nanjing in 1842 um, forces open the treaty ports, uh, forces the seating of Hong Kong forces uh, the fixing of tariff rates um, uh, over key goods. Uh, some key goods, and also um, the payment of reparations um, to the British Empire. Uh, at this point, a few Chinese intellectuals and officials, including Lin Zexu, who was um, the kind of key figure on the Chinese side in the policymaking leading up to the First Opium War, have become interested in trying to make use of international law as a vocabulary to further Chinese interests. Um, and so you could argue that the very first Chinese translation of the concept of sovereignty in a Western sense actually does come at this point uh, when Lin, who was a commissioner in the uh, Guangzhou, Guangxi area um, of Southern China, was uh, made an attempt to translate um, Vatel's Joie des gens uh, into Chinese. He translated a few key sections that actually did quite, you know, in terms of the actual doctrinal content, did quite firmly support the Chinese position that a state should not be forced to open itself to foreign trade. Um, although the British side had a actually rather more novel point of view for that era, which was that uh, denial of trade to a foreign state would actually be a legitimate grounds for a military reprisal. Um, so that that doctrine is actually not contained in Vatel, but uh, the you know the Chinese side actually found itself arguing for a more well-established international law position as early as the 1840s. Um, but nonetheless, this argument was essentially went nowhere, and it was not received um, by the British side, and it was not broadcast to international society as a whole. So the actual impact of that reception was extremely minimal. Um, in the following years, uh, leading up through the Second Opium War as well, um, there was very little effective utilization on the Chinese side of Western ideas about international law or any Western international law institutions. So um, the Emperor Xianfeng, who is usually kind of glossed over in a lot of histories of this era because of um, his essentially total failure to uh, improve China's position during this period of Western coercion, um, he actually seems to have already um, been actively trying, uh, or at least he and the circle of advisors were actively trying to figure out some sort of modus vivendi with the Western powers whereby a compromise situation could be established. Um, so he was uh, the Emperor Xianfeng, uh, who ruled in 1850 to 1861, was very insistent on this notion of the guo ti, um, which uh, refers literally to what could be translated. Um, it's a very difficult concept to translate or to render um, because it is very much a kind of traditional Chinese notion, uh, which has no real direct equivalent in, um, uh, in, I would argue, in a Western language. But it refers literally to the states and its uh, in depending on the context, either the state form, the state structure, the state system, or the state's prestige. And all of these were essentially treated in the sources as being almost equivalent with each other, or at least flowing in between each other. So the prestige of the state and maintaining the prestige of the state was treated as being closely linked with the system of the state's uh, form of governance and, uh, and structure of government. Um, and so respecting the governance structure of the state was also equivalent to respecting the prestige and honor of the state. Uh, and these were terms that were utilized um, relatively frequently in relations with other powers, including uh, in the relations with the West in the 19th century, but also in uh, dealings between the Chinese, uh, between the Qing dynasty and uh, weaker regional peoples that it engaged with, including those in uh, Xinjiang uh, in the far west, 
including those in Vietnam and in uh, other kind of border areas where officials would discuss what should we do, what policies should we adopt in order to maintain the guoti. And again, this would either be the prestige and or the structure and system of the state. Um, so the Qing officials find themselves arguing about what it, what would it mean to preserve the guoti, to preserve this value that they put in the same position that later on they would put sovereignty in a more Western sense. Uh, and what they find is that they actually disagree with each other. So some figures, including the emperor, view the person of the emperor as being the most important aspect of the guoti, of the state system slash state prestige. And so he is most concerned about keeping the foreign emissaries and embassies out of Beijing as a sacred imperial space. Uh, and the emperor is willing to, in some of the treaty negotiations ongoing in, as part of the second opium war, is willing to give up the, um, the state's uh, policy autonomy over the ability to set tariffs, for example, and instead to establish essentially a free trade zone for Western uh, commerce. Uh, and this is something that is opposed by many of the Qing officials. Um, so some of them, including his own brother, Prince Gong, uh, argue that actually what's most important to the Guoti is that we avoid opening up the Yangtze River to the Western ships for trade, as well as probably military coercion. So there is this actually open disagreement about the nature of the Guoti, uh, what it means to preserve this value, the state value uh, in the face of the Western international legal demands. And early on, we do see some figures adopting this more territorially oriented, jurisdictionally oriented view of what this means. Um, so the demand to open up China's rivers was uh, sort of of a piece with many of the international law transformations happening during the 19th century, which were centered on uh, internationalization of major rivers, of uh, the establishment of uh, essentially forms of governance and access, including to steamships, uh, to gunboats, to specific um, major waterways. Um, and this was something that was occurring via international treaty legislation uh, in these different contexts of which the Chinese example was just one among many. So we see this happening in Europe um, with uh, the organization for uh, the Danube uh, actually being the kind of uh, one of the very first international organizations ever to be established. Um, and uh, we see this with the demands uh, for the opening of the Chinese rivers to British gunboats. We see this in, in Africa as well, in particular with the um, uh, Belgian plans for the Congo and for the establishment of um, this sort of uh, multilaterally established regime for splitting up territory uh, in the African interior uh, that we see at uh, the Berlin uh, conference. Um, so uh, Xianfeng and his brother, who had been raised together in the palace, uh, as we see in this uh, painting from 1834, before all of this um, you know, unfolded, uh, the two male children here are, uh, are depicting the emperor and his brother uh, with the, the former emperor, Da Guang, sitting uh, uh, in blue on the bench um, up there at, at the kind of front right. Um, the emperor and his brother clearly had very different understandings. Uh, and in a sense, this is something that uh, where we already see this beginning of the divergence of views uh, where some Chinese actors, including in the very highest levels of the officialdom, um, begin to be very interested in these more territorial state oriented interpretations of uh, what we what they would come to call sovereign rights. Um, so the emperor promotes his what he called internally determined approach of zero tariff trade in return for keeping the Westerners out of Beijing and, and uh, his officials, including uh, his brother, the prince, um, really essentially refused to go along with this. Um, following the Second Opium War is when we really get these international multilateral treaties that begin to regulate Chinese territory. And the emperor uh, coming back after having fled Beijing is essentially forced to agree to the establishment of, for the first time, an actual body uh, of government, an agency for conducting international trade and commerce. Uh, 
Uh, and so this becomes what is called, uh, what he wants to give the title, the Office in Charge of Affairs Relating to Commerce with Various Nations. And again, um, his brother has to intervene in order to say that we should re remove the words only relating to commerce, because when the Westerners talk about diplomacy, they actually mean comprehensive diplomacy about a range of different issues that can be established and dealt with via treaties uh, and bilateral or multilateral negotiations. It's not just establishing a few rules for how goods are supposed to pass through um, our ports, but rather we essentially from now on will need to be in constant uh, negotiations with the West. Uh, and so even after this point, this idea of uh, of, a inter of global governance, of an international regulation occurring through legal instruments and institutions is something that we see only some of the progressive figures on the Chinese side really coming to terms with. Um, so this uh, leads into the actual process of adoption of the legal norms. Um, this occurs through acts of targeted translation. So the most famous of these um, that has been looked at in prior uh, secondary scholarship um, as kind of this kind of key turning point is the translation of uh, Henry Wheaton's Elements of International Law into Chinese um, in this 1863 edition by the American missionary William A.P. Martin uh, as uh, Wang Guo Gongfa, or the International Law of the 10,000 or the Myriad States, uh, the Countless States. Um, and this is where we first see doctrines of sovereignty being rendered into Chinese uh, and in, in, introduced into Chinese letters essentially as objects of discourse. Um, it remains quite a limited um, set of ideas in terms of its reach, but we see within the diplomatic community, within to a lesser extent, the community of uh, high level officials, some of these ideas do begin to per permeate. And the idea of uh, state sovereignty as rather clumsily translated into Chinese in Wheaton's text do begin to take hold. Um, so Wheaton, uh, uh, so Martin uh, himself uh, is actually quite an interesting figure. And one of the things that I also tried to do here um, in the book uh, as it gets into the middle sections was to look at these figures that were these sorts of key intermediaries between China and the West and to kind of try and deepen a little bit of our existing understandings of them. Um, so Martin has often been presented in uh, many of the existing international legal um, accounts of, of uh, China's role in, in global legal history as this very positive kind of bridge building figure. Um, if you actually go back and look at some of his activities and statements, he was really very much somebody who promoted this idea of kind of uh, re military reprisal, forcing China to open its doors, this idea that the British were in the right uh, in the Opium Wars, um, that it was, uh, uh, for example, um, that a good policy for the West would be to promote Han Chinese nationalism because the Han Chinese were a more progressive race than the Manchu. And so just like the Protestants are more progressive than the Catholics, uh, in Europe, um, that the Han Chinese would be a more progressive force that should be, uh, that the West should ally itself with to try and actively reshape the map of the Chinese state and promote Western ideas of, of state and national sovereignty. Um, and so these kinds of ideas, um, as well as Martin um, and his own kind of combination of his uh, personal career interests, uh, along with his activities in relation to the Chinese state, uh, are kind of interesting parts of this story that I tried to um, to look at uh, alongside the broader reception history of the ideas, uh, because I think if you look at uh, many of the actual figures um, that are acting as the kind of most progressive uh, intermediaries between the West and China, the ones that are actually engaging it in these international law conversations, um, a lot of them were actually what we would think of today as being quite imperialist, nonetheless, in their positions and um, proposals. So uh, this goes for the later era eras where we see pacifists as well, uh, Western pacifists at the Hague conferences uh, and later on, uh, also promoting ideas such as international management of Chinese territory or the international re-staffing of the Chinese judiciary, with uh, in, with global foreign uh, judges coming from the West um, as ways to sort of improve Chinese governance. 
Um, and so that uh, that context is something that um, I also thought uh, and claim helped to promote the turning of many Chinese intellectuals, uh, including some sort of key diplomats and lawyers, towards Japan as a as a source of influence. Um, the Japanese side uh, throughout the late 1800s was adopting a relatively nuanced set of positions um, whereby they were, uh, on the one hand, acknowledging that they were very much endeavoring to be a modern state after the Western mold and to adopt Western legal and political doctrines, uh, but at the same time were also uh, exerting uh, influence in China in a kind of more sense of an informal uh, sphere of influence with some pan-Asianist civilizational rhetoric as well intended to motivate solidarity. Um, so for the Qing dynasty and its actors who had a very difficult time making this transition fully into the Western doctrines of state sovereignty, um, really clinging on to the Guoti notion um, really up through the uh, early part of the 20th century, um, the Japanese influence actually ended up being uh, quite significant as many of the translated texts that contain specific references to uh, sovereignty, including in this Chinese character form of Juchen, uh, were coming through Japan. Um, and so there is this uh, 1874 memorandum, uh, which uh, I argue play, played a very major role in this transmission process, uh, in which the Japanese interior minister, uh, Okubo Toshimichi, who was one of those who had gone actually on a study trip to the West, uh, who had actually met personally with uh, Chancellor Bismarck uh, in, um, uh, in the newly formed German Empire, uh, and had received, you know, very much absorbed these ideas about what it means to be a state sovereign under the late 19th century European system. Um, Okubo sends this memorandum as part of the Qing-Japan negotiations over Taiwan, in which there's this very strategic usage of the Western international law vocabulary uh, to enforce ideas about uh, sovereignty as Juchuan. And we see again Vatel coming into the uh, conversation and coming into the conversation uh, in terms of defining uh, what sort of sovereignty is recognized under this Western law of nations, which the Japanese side is now treating as being universal um, and as being something that they demand of the Chinese um, government. So uh, on the one hand, Japan is pressing its sort of imperial aims already by this early period, and it is using Western international law to do so. On the other hand, it is actually much less successful at doing that up through the kind of pivotal 1894-1895 Sino-Japanese War, at which point it gathers, um, you know, control of uh, Taiwan as well as uh, key part pieces of Manchuria, as well as uh, of the ability to colonize um, the Korea. Uh, Korea. Um, and uh, at that point, we see uh, Japan becoming uh, beginning to take up more of its current role as this sort of uh, key rival figure. But even through the 1920s and into the 1930s, there is still a substantial element of the Chinese officialdom and society that is interested in looking to Japan as a potential source of cooperation and collaboration uh, if some sort of compromise position can be reached where the Japanese side will respect Chinese sovereignty to a greater extent than the West has done so far. Uh, and of course, the message from the West and from Western supporters in China is the opposite, that the Japanese are purely rapacious imperialists, whereas the West has become quite progressive in the aftermath of the First World War, uh, especially, and the idea is that the West will promote um, no, more autonomy for the Chinese side. Um, so in the, these sort of key early 20th century conferences, we see Chinese officials pursuing both agendas, attempting to make a uh, parlay with the West and to reach um, agreements on these kinds of norms that would be more amenable to Chinese sovereignty. Uh, at the same time, there are efforts going in the direction of uh, uh, Latin American states and uh, in, to a certain extent, other global South states as they come into the international system in the post-World War I period in particular. 
Um, but what we see when we look at these conferences in the early part of the 20th century, up through really uh, the very end of this period into the um, San Francisco conference, uh, is this uh, very sharp limit that's faced by the Chinese actors, as I mentioned earlier, um, where proposals regarding things such as a clear definition of what does war mean in inter international law, how can force be restricted, uh, rules regarding the uh, limitations on the supposed duties owed to foreigners on national territory. Um, these are things that are argued about uh, at the Hague Peace Conferences in the aftermath of the First World War, at the Paris Peace Conference, at the Washington Naval Conference in 1921, uh, and at the Hague Codification Conference in 1930. And at, essentially at each of these stages, the Chinese positions, which call for greater autonomy for China and also for non-Western peoples in general, to the extent that they have recognized states, um, uh, are essentially quite unsuccessful. Um, nonetheless, there is the ability to improve China's own position within international institutions. And so by the advent of the League of Nations, uh, there there is a Chinese, uh, there are Chinese figures that are able to, uh, for example, represent China as a rotating member of the Council of the League of Nations. Uh, China is able to gain its first international judge in the person of Wang Chongkui on the Permanent Court of International Justice. Uh, and other Chinese lawyers uh, begin to have a significant role, at least in the discourse of international law, in settings such as the Institut de Droit International, where the first Chinese member uh, named Zhou Wei uh, comes on board and begins to argue quite consistently for um, more global governance and stronger prohibitions on uh, states' uses of military force uh, in particular. So these agendas of restricting uh, uses of force to which China had been subjected quite consistently, as well as a greater codification of international legal norms begin to be adopted uh, in a quite consistent way across these conferences of the early 20th century and they are quite consistent with a certain interpretation of state sovereignty that, to a large extent, is actually uh, in line with some aspects of a Western um, uh, mainstream view of, uh, of, the, of the qualities of state sovereignty, but that places a still greater emphasis on uh, factors such as autonomy and policymaking, the ability of a state to set its own tariffs uh, and uh, to decide on its own standards for the treatment of foreigners, uh, as well as to, um, in the terms of some, the suggestions of some of these interlocutors on the Chinese side, to restrict access to territory to foreign military vessels, uh, or indeed to internationalize military forces at the global level, um, which was a, a Chinese proposal um, that was that really we did not go very far uh, with the with the Western powers uh, towards the end of World War II. Um, and nonetheless, uh, these agendas, which involved uh, pushing for these uh, kinds of actually increased attention to inter international legal norms um, and increased emphasis upon the use of international law to establish China's position as a state that was capable of enjoying state uh, equality with other sovereigns, with other sovereign states, and to also go beyond equality and to adopt its position among one of the first rank uh, great powers uh, in whatever context that might look like within the, the order of the League of Nations versus that of the United Nations uh, Security Council, as it eventually turned out to be. Uh, these agendas were being pursued simultaneously, and they, there was a slight conflict between them. On the one hand, you see the Chinese officials as well as activists arguing for the equality of all states. On the other hand, in their actual official activities within international organizations, they are consistently arguing for that China should be considered as one of the great powers because of its size, its economic um, potential, its military potential, um, its importance in the war efforts, uh, etc., so um, these Chinese representatives do find themselves making both arguments. Um, and you could argue that this is kind of a, reflects some of this imperial legacy of this Guoti concept, um, so that there is this sense of not just uh, equality of China with other sovereign states, although they do make a point of emphasizing that principle, 
but also of state uh, prestige as needing to be among the highest rank of uh, powers within the international legal order, and also of um, the need for China's own internal governance system and autonomy to be respected uh, to a greater degree than was actually the case under the standard international law doctrine of the era. So kind of going beyond um, mainstream definitions of sovereignty in that sense. Um, the latter part of, uh, of that story, which has to do with the kind of transition into the People's Republic of China period and this new agenda of, on the one hand, engagement with the, with the socialist uh, positions on international law held by the Soviet Union and its satellites, as well as with the third world global south states and the Chinese interactions with those at the Bandung Conference and other such settings, um, I argue are to a large extent actually continuous with what we saw during the early 20th century period. So this is true both in terms of some of the key positions, including definitions of sovereign rights, and also in terms of um, this factor having to do with the uh, emphasis on state autonomy and on the rejection of external governance and management coming from the outside. So um, just to close up the presentation of, uh, of the book and its findings, um, I think that some of the key aspects that uh, are really worth dwelling upon further and potentially exploring in future scholarship include some of these figures um, that played important roles in the history but ended up being semi-forgotten both in, in the West and in China uh, because they did not quite fit well into any of the existing narratives uh, regarding this history of China in, in the international legal order. So I tend to focus on this figure of Zhou Wei in particular um, because he was quite you know, accomplished and uh, significant as the first, uh, as uh, one of the people to first propose an international organization before the League of Nations was established. So before Wilson had really figured out exactly what he wanted, Zhou Wei was already essentially writing a, a, a treatise calling for an international legal organization that looked quite a lot like a League of Nations. And he was one of the very first legal scholars uh, to do so, uh, who was studying in uh, Geneva at the time. Uh, first Chinese member of the Institut de Droit International um, and uh, eventually and active in during China's membership of the League of Nations, um, engaging in these uh, discourses about prohibitions of aggression and other such topics. Later, because he collaborated with Japan, he ended up being disgraced and essentially subjected to you know almost total wiping out uh, in the existing histories. Uh, of the period. He is still mentioned um, in, in Chinese histories of the period, but in a much smaller role than he ultimately played, um, uh, despite the fact that most of his activities during this era were actually quite patriotic in nature, and he was promoting Chinese state slash national interests. Um, so some of these figures, I think, bear a little bit more excavation uh, going forward. Uh, also, uh, these the process of hegemonic contestation between Chinese and Western actors, uh, as well as Japan, at many of these key conferences. Um, I think uh, there are many aspects there that remain to be further explored. Um, the way that these key moments, such as the Washington Naval Conference, uh, and of course Dumberton Oaks and the San Francisco Conference, functioned as these kinds of constitutional or global constitutional moments where different agendas were brought to bear from the different sides uh, and ended up resulting in compromised solutions that affected not only international law norms, but even domestic law arrangements and forms of governance. Um, I think uh, there are many more stories there that remain to be told. Um, and finally, uh, this, this story that I have just alluded to as well about the conflicting agendas of the Chinese state in international law on the one hand, promoting this very strong um, rhetorical and sometimes doctrinal commitment to state equality. And on the other hand, promoting China as a member of the most uh, top ranking uh, decision making mechanisms, uh, whether it is in the League of Nations context uh, or, or even at the Hague uh, conventions, uh, Hague conferences. Um, or, of course, now in the context of the UN Security Council and the Chinese positions on global governance today, where strict definitions of state equality can be relativized in favor of UN Security Council norms um, that promote China as one of the decision makers. <laughs>
Um, at the same time, the Chinese international lawyer community has been uh, remarkably liberal over time and very interested in promoting global governance uh, in many different spheres, including international economic law, international environmental law, and many other aspects of uh, global governance. Um, and there too, there's been a somewhat of a conflict between those agendas within the community of lawyers and the agendas of the state uh, as a whole, which have been premised on these uh, these two other values of sovereign state equality and uh, first rank state prestige. So um, I'll just uh, wrap up the remarks there and um, just uh, yeah, thank you all for uh, listening and really welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell, for your presentation.